Turn your iPods up to 11 because you're listening to Six String Bliss, episode 198. This episode, we've got an interview with the man behind Blackbird Guitars, plus we're going to talk about rock biographies, a listener-requested guitarist of the week, and so much more. It's going to make you ill, all right here on Six String Blitz. We got we got a lot to talk about this episode. Let's get right into it. We got an interview, a, a boutique bliss interview. Sweet. So, uh, you know, boutique bliss. What's boutique bliss? Pipes. Tell tell them tell them what's well, up. Boutique bliss. Boutique bliss is you know we're not that savvy to be able to really really cover the boutique stuff very well. True. However, member of our team is that savvy. So uh, Larry um, has decided to take care of the boutique stuff for us and arrange some fantastic interviews with uh with the boutique builders the people that you know we're just not smart enough to ask the right questions to <laughs> isn't that everybody uh, oh yeah i'm not gonna answer that <laughs> so then, anyway this time uh larry's got joe from blackbird guitars um I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by blackbird guitars so i'm interested in hearing hearing this one for sure Let's uh, let's see what what Larry's got up his sleeve here. Hi, and welcome to Boutique Bliss, a segment delving into the world of bleeding edge guitar technology and the intrepid designers who bring these marvels from the drawing board to your favorite boutique music store. Joining us today is Joe Lutvac, founder of Blackbird Guitars. Blackbird entered the guitar market with The Writer, a compact carbon fiber travel guitar that boasts the sound quality of a full size instrument. Joe, welcome to the program. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Uh, Joe, our first question is, what was your first guitar? And that's the first guitar that you owned. Well, I'm afraid it's nothing exciting. No, like, 1920s vintage Martin that was found in, you know, in a barn somewhere in New Hampshire. My mom had the uh, presence of mind to buy me um, a solid spruce top Honer guitar, which was just a, an Asian-made cheapie but was decent enough with the solid spruce top that it wasn't, you know, it was satisfying enough that I could actually learn to play on it. And, and I kept, I still have it around as a sort of memento. Um, so that's the first guitar. The significant thing about that guitar, you know, it obviously the action sucked and all that, but the significant thing about it, um, was that at about, you know, I got it when I was 15 and then about, a year and a half later, for some other some reason that's long forgotten, it um it, it got its neck cracked in half. Ooh! And so, uh, you know, my mom had a little workshop downstairs. She'd made jewelry and stuff, and um, and so I just I just took the guitar downstairs to the basement and dug up some wood glue and went to the hardware store, and it became like my first sort of like repair job on a guitar. I, I don't consider myself the handiest guy in the world, but I managed to fix that guitar. Then totally, it was totally clean, and it gave me a real sense of uh, accomplishment, um, you know, in a way that I hadn't before then. So it was kind of a you know a premonition of things to come, I guess. Um, I didn't go on like a lot of stories to start repairing guitars and apprentice in a workshop or whatever. I you know I went off to college and eventually learned to become a designer. Um, right. But that was definitely a first moment where I realized that, you know, guitars were a not perfect, and b that I had the ability to to fix something when it was broken in general. And so it was really an empowering moment. Very nice. Uh, did I do okay on the introduction uh, mentioning the writer being your first uh, your first foray into the guitar market? Yeah. So the writer was. <laughs> an answer to a problem for me in a very deep personal way. Uh, I'm a songwriter and I, you know, I, I was sort of, I tried to do that for a living at some point. And, uh, and at the same time, I'm equally interested in going backpacking and, and getting stuck in the wilderness for extended periods. And, um, I, you know, been around fair, fair amount and could never find a travel guitar 
that was worth bringing along pretty much. I mean, that's my standard line and, and that's the deal. I also, you know, I went sailing and I had opportunity to do lots of exciting things. And, you know, at a certain point on a sailboat, I was, I was on a sort of week long trip and the boat was small enough that, that there wasn't any guitars on it. And it just, you know, I had just finished a stint over, uh, at Ferrari. I was in Italy and, you know, immersed in carbon fiber um, and I think that's when the seeds of the whole the plan started, which was that I knew that I could make a higher performance travel guitar than had existed by using the kind of race car, all hollow race car sort of style monocoque construction, you know, unibody design. Um, and of course, carbon fiber in general is just such a high performance material that um, I was fairly certain that at least it would be stronger, lighter, and um, and at that point I didn't even know enough about Luthery, but turns out it's going to be you know sort of more resonant too if it's designed right, and that's that's how it eventually became. It was a long process to get it from initial idea to a a successful, uh, satisfying instrument. Of course, lots of prototypes, but at the end of the day, you know, a lot of tweaking uh, where we we kind of got there. So. If someone would just give me like a vacation, I could finally take this thing on a back. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, that was uh, that was about that was 2006, um, and so you know we've pretty much frozen the design now, probably at the end of 2008. But it you know it was a good 10 generations uh, after prototyping to get it dialed in. And the great thing about that is if you can get a small guitar to sound good, it's easy to get a big guitar to sound good. Sure. So. That led to our kind of, you know, obvious path. Our first Super OM, just out the door, was was a pretty good instrument, and I think that's just a testament to how hard it is to make small-bodied instruments. Right. Now, had you previously designed a guitar, or was the writer the your first attempt? There are lots of designs that went into the writer. So the design process, which is taken from my background as a product designer, involved a pretty wide array of solutions, many of which are pretty out there, like a kind of cylindrical tube that has a, a kind of retractable neck. I mean, and that's actually a design I had kicking around for a long time. So there it is. It's out in the public domain. Anyone who wants it, have, have at it. It's going to be a real, a real fun engineering project. Right. Uh, but I had, no, t- you know, to be honest, I actually have been drawing. I used to draw cars, right, um, all through my youth. And um, actually, there's it's a pretty good training to, to, to draw guitars, also a symmetric thing, also kind of rectangular. But I did also sort of, in starting in high school, kind of just draw guitars, just come up with new ideas for guitars. So my, you know, my textbooks and my binders in high school even, you, you, you know, are, are lined with different drawings of guitars. And I have been interested in the form for a while. I, I was playing them and I you know, used to draw. And so naturally I got into designing them and, you know, I find, and sort of the common thought in product design these days is the more ideas you can throw down on the table, the more solutions that you can come up with to problems that folks have, um, visually, and that's the key. It's like visual. And, and the, the more you can not edit yourself as far as coming up with new and innovative solutions, the more innovative that will be in the end. And so I, came up with lots and lots of ideas uh, to, that went into the rider. Sorry, that was a bit long-winded, but um, the answer is, it's not my first design. <laughs> right. um, I know that you've got partners in, in Blackbird Guitars. Do you mind sharing a little of the development of the company? Yeah, so uh, I certainly did not do this even remotely alone, uh, and by no means do I want to come off like I'm saying that. I am the designer. The company was started with a fellow named Kyle Wolf, who uh, we were in a graduate program together uh, studying what's called industrial arts, which is just product design. He's a model maker, and so hence all the uh, the laser cutting and the panograph machine and, and basically the, the skill to make anything, essentially. And so he was instrumental at getting us um, that first prototype, and he you know quickly moved away, and so he was associated with the company for the first kind of uh, crucial year, and then he's moved on to other things. And he was replaced by Troy Stevens, who's another fellow that uh, that I was in graduate program with. 
um, who has a carpentry background, um, as well as a uh, kind of what we call automated manufacturing, which is that you know CNC routers and computer aided design. So he's also a designer, but he's a great fabricator, if you will, mm-hmm. and um, and can automate that process so that you know for production as well. So uh, so Troy was was a key part of dialing in all our dimensions and our production process. You know, taking my ideas, which were on paper, and putting them into a 3D virtual environment where we could kind of prototype in 3D before it became anything real. That's significant because we're a small company, um, but we come up with a new model every year. Right. Uh, which in wood is no big deal, but in carbon fiber, that means a new mold, a new product, dev- you know, new product development in the CAD thing. And so Troy helped that happen for sure. And uh, and that's the plan, you know. Pretty much every year, release another model. Right. Um, and the other key part partner in the team, or he's not a partner, but a key player is is a young fellow named Jeremy Borcat, who is basically because of you know my and Troy's sort of production process, he is he's our basically our luthier now, and we trained him what we knew, but he's long since run with it and is uh, is what I would consider a master luthier. And he, he, he does all the fret work on all our guitars uh, at the moment. He also assembles them. And so in many ways, we are you know, as small of a shop as you can possibly manage, imagine. Mm-hmm. We're able to produce more than you know, the sort of requisite 12 guitars a year that, that a standard luthier would do. You know, we can, we're, we're doing about 20 times that. But uh, the reason for that is because of the carbon fiber process, not because it's not handmade. Um, right. We can we mold these bodies, we press these tops, we have suppliers that help us with main, with main components, and then we're able to assemble them all here in San Francisco and set them up and fret them under the you know the entire control of a master luthier. Mm-hmm. That's a real big difference between you know almost any company that's not a small shop. Or you know a Collings, you know, which is sort of a high-end small shop. Right. Um, this is the idea of if one person, one instrument. Um, I actually got that notion um, aside from the kind of existing norm in Lu3. I got that from Ferrari. You know, it's interesting. Each car, each engine is built by one guy. Um, I think they may have since changed that. But when I was there about ten years ago, that's how they were doing it. You know, it's a car, right? But guitars have infinitely even more soul pa- possibilities than a car. But there is something about the gestalt of one man, one instrument that I'm committed to. Terrific. Since this is an audio-only program, would you mind trying to describe the writer for our audience? Yeah, so the writer is um, – the first thing that most folks notice is that it is made out of something other than wood then folks that are familiar with carbon fiber will will generally jump to that conclusion. So that's a fabric, and it is put in a female mold um, and then basically cured and then clear-coated. And so what you see is you see this high-gloss clear coat, and under it is this undulating fabric, and it really has a beautiful look of its own that, that is, you know, that is sort of hypnotic in my opinion. And the other thing then that folks notice when they see the rider is uh, the unconventional shape. It doesn't have uh, the st- traditional double O curves. The reason for that is uh, it's a more efficient size for the sound box. Mm-hmm. And um, so we have more physical air in the sound box based on the exterior dimensions of the instrument. So I said when I designed the thing, why shrink a normal guitar? when they're shaped so that they're a certain size to fit in a person's body. Once you shrink it, you don't need that, you know, you don't need those curves anymore to, to sort of that waist to fit your arm into and your body into. Uh, so when we got rid of that, we basically cheated, you know, the design of a guitar. Um, and that's definitely a striking aspect of the, uh, the instrument, the curveless design. Uh, it certainly makes it louder. I can tell you that. Then we took the sound hall off the middle. Other people have done that. We actually took it completely off the instrument. And so you have a big surface area for the soundboard. That's another thing that folks sort of are, you know, sort of wowed by, if you will. The other kind of smaller detail that is important is there's a sound port in the head. Uh, and that's to let the sound reverberate out of 
the headstock that's being produced in the sound box, traveling down the neck, uh, and then coming out of the 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 sound uh, the sound hole up there. So um, the other kind of aspect uh, that's the front of the instrument, if you will. The back of the instrument is all sculpted for access to the higher frets in a way that you would never be able to do with wood, uh, and it's uh, it's also sculpted for comfort. Um, with a compound curve for stiffness and, and um, lots of lots of details. Every every inch of this instrument was poured over, as far as trying to maximize, you know, the functionality and also the aesthetic. So that's pretty much the physical description. You know, I, I just encourage folks to play these guitars because it's the uh, the sound coming out of the instrument is really uh, uncanny. It's just so rich and powerful for such a small guitar. It's 40% the size. Excuse me, it's 40% smaller than a conventional acoustic guitar. Uh, so it is noticeably smaller. Um, and to have that kind of rich voice come out of the design, which is you know, a holistic uh, combination of all these different design features, which I mentioned, you know, just is, uh, it's really uh, it's a satisfying experience. You know, the other thing I should mention is uh, the unusual design often gives you know, traditionalists and just guitarists in general some pause because they're worried it'll slip off their legs. So we actually work with neck up to make guitar supports they made a with our design they made a custom neck up so that's an optional item if people want to you know have a more ergonomic guitar than a conventional guitar once that thing's strapped on uh, it's more ergonomic and so that's a little kickstand sort of a la the old steinbergers right right um, and that pretty much wraps it up okay now how do you perceive the market's reaction to carbon fiber guitars in general? I, I don't just mean the writer or, or travel guitars. I mean, you know, carbon fiber guitars. Do you think uh, more people are starting to embrace the technology? Uh, well, clearly everyone sort of, you know, there's been a lot more guitars available uh, in recent years, lots of different options. Uh, and, you know, I know that we personally have grown the market as far as, recognition for carbon fiber guitars uh, and acceptance. You know, there's lots of reasons for carbon fiber instruments, and by no means are they going to replace or even come to close to the size of, of wooden guitars ever, I believe. They're harder to make in many ways, and uh, they're very expensive to make. And so they're going to always be kind of on the fringes, I think. And in that fringe, you have a superior product because uh, wood is, is essentially, you know, too fragile to build light enough. Now, that, what I mean by that is you'll, ha you know, you'll, you'll listen to a lot of luthiers talk on, on, on this show or, or read articles. And, and if you get down to it, one of the main themes in um, the boutique kind of high-performance wooden guitars, I would call it, or the... The, uh, the responsive guitar, as it's known, is that the top is very lightly built. This is acoustic guitars, of course, and the top is basically so lightly built that the guitar is uh, designed to implode eventually, mm -hmm. and eventually may not be you know, a generation even. So, and this is by design. These, are, these guys want to get the most sound out of these instruments, and so they design these things so lightly that more of the, the, uh, the vibrating strings, uh, excuse me, the energy from the vibrations of the strings get translated into the sound box to create sound. With carbon fiber, we can build even lighter than those wooden guitars, and you don't have to worry about it. So that's why I say it's superior to wood, mm -hmm. just from a purely resonant perspective. I think you know, wooden instruments are wonderful, um, but I think that carbon fiber has lots, of, lots to offer anyone who owns a wooden instrument. Um, typically, folks will have several guitars, which is uh, kind of an interesting sign of the times. But, um, you know, anyone who has a nice wooden guitar needs to consider a carbon fiber instrument as an insurance plan because that nice wooden guitar eventually will, will kind of encourage you to take it out of the house for some reason. And in many cases, that's just a bad idea. So, you know, you, got, you leave... <laughs> You leave, you know, you live in Florida, so it's, you know, you could be air conditioning at home in the summer and take it out into the humidity, and, you know, there you go, the crack. So, um, so that's why I say that, you know, it's important to have a totally satisfying guitar, which carbon fiber can offer in spades, 
and it's important to protect those fancy wooden guitars and leave them at home. And so that's why I think there's going to be always a place for carbon fiber. It's a growing place as people recognize this. But I still think that wood is, you know, for many reasons, you know, manufacturing alone is going to be the dominant player for many years to come. I, I should also say an interesting point. You know, you can almost buy a cheap wooden guitar. Those tend to last longer because they're built very, you know, overbuilt, as mm-hmm. we say. The only problem there is that you don't have a satisfying instrument. Right. So, so that's the kind of dynamic. Um, so, you know, lots of people are doing interesting things with carbon fiber as far as instruments, um, and I think that that's adding a real cool dimension to the burgeoning, this kind of burgeoning sub blue three category. And you know, I would say that I hope you know composite acoustics gets resurrected because I, I really appreciate what they do. Mm-hmm. Rain song uh, has you know its kind of traditional shtick, which they do well. There's a guy out of Ireland, Emerald. Right. I haven't really play, played any of his instruments, but uh, but he's you know he's pushing his own directions, and, and I think that's cool. And um, I'm sure that there'll be more coming up here. For us, carbon fiber is a means to an end. Right. And I believe for everyone else, it's an end. Right. Now, the the line you mentioned that you uh, anticipate or, or you have a goal of bringing out one new guitar a year, and it looks like you've pretty much done that. Uh, would you mind going through the timeline of developing the Blackbird line as it stands now? Um, a typical like model development process? Is that what you Well, mean? basically... Uh, uh, the the order that models were released and and the uh, reasoning behind, you know, choosing uh, which guitar came next. Sure. Okay. So well, we covered the Blackbird Rider steel string, um, basically a backpacking, the ultimate backpacking travel guitar. And what followed was the nylon string, the Blackbird Rider nylon. I'm a you know I I did study classical guitar at a certain point. The li- Rider Nylon looks similar to the to the Rider Steel String. In fact, it's a completely different guitar. It is wider by an inch and a half, so it's 12 inches wide. Um, still a travel instrument, but um, to get those nylon strings to, to drive the top, we had to make the instrument slightly bigger. It's also a full classical scale, which is 650 millimeters. And, you know, basically with that instrument, we wanted to make uh, a carbon fiber travel guitar for nylon string players. It's that simple. They didn't have anything. They don't have good travel guitars, really. They don't have any nylon. There's no such thing as a. There's no such thing as a carbon fiber nylon string until we came along. I think Rain Song did one years ago, but that was a quick and not successful situation for them. And so we had a lot of people ask for this nylon string, and so we did it. And it's been much more successful than we would have imagined because that's a much smaller market. And interestingly, our you know our clients helped us design it. So they got us to use the RMC you know individual saddle pickup. So six pickups, mm-hmm. um, and so now it's kind of sneaked in the back door into MIDI. And many people tell us it's the best MIDI guitar they've ever played. So no, the the cool thing about the Rider Nylon is you have a great practice guitar as far as classical jazz or whatever as an acoustic guitar. It's a great acoustic guitar. Still, you know, huge bass, big volume for a small box like that, as much as you'd ever need. And then you plug it in, and you basically have the best nylon string amplified experience, both acoustically, and then, you know, if you want to get into MIDI, uh, carbon fiber is so much more consistent than wood, so it MIDI tracks perfectly. Um, And so the the combination of the RMC system and our guitar, from what our our artists are telling us, is basically a new level of, you know, new level of MIDI guitar. Wow, that totally surprised us, but there it is, you know? Right. It caught us totally off guard. Uh, it is considered the best MIDI guitar by many people. So that's that. Um, we also chose to use, like, the highest grade tuners, Gilbert tuners, local guy. They're, you know, it's pretty much the best you can get. Um, the idea, again, is this is a professional instrument that will satisfy many problems and many needs. It gets very versatile. Um, and so it's really hard to even put it in a box because nothing, there's nothing at all like it out there. So then come uh, the next year at NAM, which was 2009, uh, we launched um, our Super OM, which was basically our first sort of full-size guitar. It's still kind of small body. It's an orchestra model, but it's, you know, it's the kind of sculpted and all that to feel really comfortable and, 
and compact. But but it's it's a real guitar. It's a full size guitar and twenty five and a half inch scale. And the idea with this instrument is you can have a dreadnought, a real nice dreadnought in terms of the power, uh, the bass, the volume. In, um, in a much more comfortable configuration. So I think lots of people are dealing with an ergonomic nightmare of playing a dreadnought, and, and basically sh they shouldn't need to if we can get the same amount of power out of a smaller guitar, and that's the idea with Supro M. Mm -hmm. Supro M, like all our guitars, is, is a monocoque design, so the body, neck, and head are, are one piece. And so in the case of the nylon as well, once you plug this thing in, you've got insane sustain for an acoustic guitar. I mean, it approaches an electric guitar in terms of the sustain. It's a one-piece design, no parts, nothing to get in the, way, in the way of sustain. The whole thing's resonating. And so we have lots of folks tell us that it's great acoustic electric as well. The other thing that's really interesting about our instruments, and, and uh, this goes across the board, is the note-to-note -note separation, the evenness up and down the fretboard from the pr first position past the 12th. You know, it plays like, basically, you don't have... The, the fallbacks of a conventional acoustic so that when you play above the 12th fret, the note just dives off of a cliff. This is all due to the one-piece design and the carbon fiber. Um, I may sound like I'm selling here, but I'm just trying to give off the various differences and what makes this thing unique. Sure. And there, there are a lot of things. Um, the Super OM also features a body scoop, which is like you know a strat, essentially. And something you would never do with, with wood it would be a nightmare. Um, but uh, that helps make the instrument feel smaller. There's also a scoop up where the neck attaches to the body, and that allows for access to, you know, past the 16th fret. Um, and then last year at NAM, that be this, excuse me, this last year, so NAM 2010, we released um, our ukulele, which is just a kind of miniature version of the Super OM. Right. And um, it is, it was a project we did for R&D initially, and then we got a lot of positive feedback, and um, so we got this really powerful, bassy, for a little guitar, a little ukulele, tenor uke, that, you know, no one's ever made a carbon fiber one, and I suppose that's reason enough for a lot of folks to check it out, and, and people have given us pretty rave reviews so far, so we're real, we're real excited about that, because that, that we just, we never expected to be as popular as it is, mm -hmm. so... Who knows? Maybe we'll, we'll be doing more ukes in the future. Um, uh, we'll see how it goes. It's too soon to say. We're about to deliver the first batch of them only in May. You know, they say NAM is uh, not available maybe May. Right. Whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, that's definitely the case with us. It's been, uh, it's always, it always takes us longer than we expect to sure. do stuff uh, initially, and then it goes, becomes the norm. And so, yeah, we're, we're drawing up our next model. Can't go into it, but uh, it's going to be... Uh, I think it's going to be pretty awesome, uh, and we'll be releasing it probably at NAMM 2011. Okay. Joe, how can someone buy a Blackbird, and is there a waiting list? There is a waiting list. It is, you know, it's about two months at the, at the moment, so it's not like a uh, uh, conventional sort of acoustic builder waiting list of several years. Right. Um, and, you know, and if you check back in a few months, there may not be a waiting list. We're... Uh, you know, we we generally built to order as far as on the custom shop side, and then we work with several dealers uh, as well. And so, you know, our dealers are we have very very close relationship with them, and uh, we make sure we only work with you know really good folks in terms of dealers. You can check our website, BlackbirdGuitar.com, uh, under the sales page. It has information about our dealers, uh, and it also has information about information about working with us directly. And, uh, you know, we often will do little custom stuff for folks, which is why we, you know, we have a strong sort of custom shop thing going. And, um, and it, yeah, in, in, in the future, we will be, you know, tripling, quadrupling our dealership. So um, that's going to be that's going to be useful for folks that aren't living currently near any of our dealers. But we do have a few spread out. Otherwise, uh, if you do buy direct, uh, you can, you know, have a three D three sort of three week audition period. Our our dealers often do the same kind of thing, you know, thirty day or whatever, um, which I think is real important for folks because they look at our guitars and they know that there's something different going on, and they just have to make sure that different is for them. Right. Know? Well, Joe, thank you very much for all of your time today. I I learned an awful lot about your company. I hope our listeners did too, and we really appreciate your coming on the program. 
It was my pleasure. Yeah, I uh, I really appreciate what you guys are doing, and and uh, hope to talk to you again down the road. Terrific, Joe. Thank you very much. All right, boutique bliss. Thanks, Larry. Yes, thank, thank you, you Joe. And very interesting stuff. Carb carbon fiber guitars. I'm all about it. We actually played these at one of the NAMM shows. We did. Um, they're pretty sick looking guitars. They were. For sure. Very cool stuff.